Hello. We're going to look now at question two, which I'm calling bismuth. Um, before you listen to the debrief or each stage of it, make sure you've had a look at the question, made some notes for yourself again, and then just listen to try and pick up some more points. Bismuth, again, as a company, has got a year ended of the 31st of December X7. Always worth sorting that out with dates and deadlines, isn't it? The first part of the question is asking us to calculate and explain an impairment loss. I would just say that this is, you know, um, foundation stage knowledge, isn't it? It's not really even advanced stage. So it's a basic standard IES 36. We're supposed to bring some of that knowledge forward. And in any case, this is only five marks. When you talk about impairment, make sure again, initially you get down the relevant points of knowledge. The first one is that impairment, remember, is only required where you have an impairment indicator. So there must be an impairment indicator. I don't know what that is in this scenario. Secondly, that the assets are divided into cash generating units. So in this scenario, the mine is an example of a cash generating unit. And when you refer to, refer to cash generating unit, remember it's something that generates an independent stream of income. Do you have to write those words? Yes. Then, again, just get some basic knowledge down here. The fact that you need to compare the carrying amount, which I'm going to abbreviate to CA, and the recoverable amount. And you know this, the recoverable amount is the greater a value in use and fair value less cost to sell. And finally, any impairment loss normally goes to the profit and loss. So it's as if you're almost like a doctor giving a lecture to your patient before you examine them. So yeah, there's a couple of marks of relevant knowledge. Now, let's have a look at these numbers here. Once we've got a mark out of the numbers, we've passed, but it would be nice to get it all right, wouldn't it? So I'm now going to apply that to the scenario. Calculation, probably on my spreadsheet. Like most calculations in two columns. I've said, didn't I, I need to find the carrying amount. Now, in the accounts, there is a mine. The mine has got a carrying amount of 200. They have a decommissioning provision. Again, this is the lower exam knowledge as opposed to this one. So you should be aware of this from your financial reporting. When you have a decommissioning provision, you set the provision up. You put the provision in liabilities and you add its carrying amount to the asset. Debit mine credit provision. So this CGU cash generating unit, the carrying amount will be the mine less the carrying amount of the provision. And the carrying amount of the provision was in the scenario 53. So that's what we've actually got today which would give me 147. I now need to go out and calculate how much money can be recovered from it in the future. The recoverable amount. So just use the numbers. Recoverable amount is looking for cash flows into the business, in and out of the business. So what do we know? 
We know that there's mining sales of 203. We know that the, um, there's also operating expenses, I'll put op costs of 48. We know that right at the end, they have some sale of components. So the component sale, the component sale is another 20. Right at the end, they then have to get the contractors in and pay them to decommission it. So to take the thing out of service. So actually, that will be a cash outflow as well. And this is the bit you've perhaps not seen before, but there'll be a payment to the contractor again. So again, the payment to decommission. And the payment to decommission again will be 53. That's an outflow, isn't it? Once you get there, we're okay. You can net those off to get a net recoverable amount, compare it to the carrying amount. And then the key thing, although we've already said so, is that whatever the loss is, will go to the profit and loss. The whole of this exam is explaining what things are and telling the directors where to stick them. Should they put them in the soft P? Not in this case. Should I put them in OCI? Not in this case. Should I put them in the P&L? Yes, I should. There we are. There's the impairment. If you need to, pause the recording before you get to the next bit about the share issue. So have a read of the share issue if you need to, and then I'll talk through. The shares, again, is worth five marks. Now, the minute that we see words like Bitcoin, unless you happen to be a dealer at work, or something, we go into great panic, don't we, and say, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm doing. Be calm. If a company is actually issuing something and receiving something in return, whether it's cash, Bitcoin, potatoes, or sausages, when it does the issuing bit, it's either issuing shares, is an equity, or it's something that's a financial liability. And you know that, for example, things like preference shares are not equity, are they? They're a financial liability. So what knowledge do I need to get down here? Surely, it has to be those definitions. The fact that equity is a residual interest in the assets after the liabilities have been deducted and also that a financial liability is an obligation to deliver cash. I think using the definition of financial liability is a bit better than just using the definition of liability because financial liability says deliver cash or technically another financial asset but we have the idea across there once you've done that we then get to look at these two types of shares um a shares first there seems to be a choice doesn't there there seems to be a choice between these things actually being redeemed with cash or shares. 
and immediately your mind says this is a convertible and you say I've learned convertibles but stop it is not the investor that has the choice it is the company that has the choice that's the difference so this is not split accounting so the company has the choice again at whatever you want to call it I mean they call it redemption so the investor has no choice they might get cash to the value of one Bitcoin or they might get shares to the value of two Bitcoins so what you're looking at really is the most likely outcome so if you're a company and you're giving out things is it more likely that you're going to give people something worth one Bitcoin or two Bitcoins and unless you're a charity or it's your brother or sister shouldn't say that really but you know what I mean it'll be the one Bitcoin won't it so ultimately I'd have thought that the likely it is likely that the company will redeem in cash and again you can see cash for every thousand A shares they're just going to have to give them twelve thousand dollars if you know they went down the share route it would be twenty four thousand dollars so I'm just saying look this is cheaper for the company So in conclusion, therefore, I think that's a financial liability. Then we get to the B shares. Let's have a look. The company does not have to buy them back, but they can buy them back. So there is no obligation to repurchase them so can you see there is no obligation to deliver cash therefore they're much more of the nature of equity so I can say there's an option but not an obligation to deliver cash so they are more likely to be of the nature of equity. I think another point you could make is that when you see this word reward in connection with this, the additional reward, you could say, well, that sounds a bit like a dividend, but I think we've written plenty there. So, you know, just the basic knowledge, try and apply it to the scenario. And it's a lot is about reading the scenario but that's a hard part does the examiner want to know what a bitcoin is no so that would be in the exam called introduction to bitcoins which we're not doing today now if you haven't please read the last part of the question pause the recording before we talk about the ethics part of the question Well, what a tale we have to tell here, isn't it? So here we are. It's just, you know, if you weren't doing it in an exam, you'd quite enjoy the question, wouldn't you? Because it's such fun. You could almost hand this out at a family party. And I'm sure your family could all say what was doing wrong. So how on earth do you turn that into marks? The point is, you've got to link it to ACCA principles and ACCA threats. So if the principles and threats aren't there, we're going to get nowhere. So everything is about applying. And if you apply the points, you'll be fine. 
We know that there are issues about Miss Pleasant. Miss Pleasant, again, um, has some knowledge from prior employment. We know that's about a breach of confidentiality and we'd be able to write about that. Does the examiner want you to share your knowledge of blockchain? Uh, no. So I think Mr. Fricklin would find it interesting uh, if you were doing a course on that. But it's not about that, is it? This is business reporting. Agriculture is in the syllabus, but the examiner is not going to ask us what a cow is. By the same virtue again, yes, there's some new technology, whatever. But the issue with Mrs. Fricklin has to be confidentiality, doesn't it? Sorry, Miss Pleasant. I've put, I don't think she's married Mr. Fricklin yet. Mr. Fricklin has no knowledge of anything, so that's professional competence. Do you care, isn't it? Um, he lied. He was untruthful. That's integrity. I think he actually then, um, he may have actually erased some data, so you're perhaps even veering towards professional behaviour. The trouble is, there are so only so many times you can use words like integrity it's a case, isn't it, of trying to glue together the principle with the scenario. So I wouldn't actually do this in columns. I'm just using it for a bit of planning and just saying, well, let's think about how we link the two together in your syllabus, in your answer. So there's a principle on the left, on the scenario on the right. So we've certainly got confidentiality. Confidentiality, key thing, isn't it, that you cannot use, again, information from the last employer. Cannot use it at all, in fact. But also, you cannot use it to your advantage. So that's an issue for Miss Pleasant. I'll put Miss P. We've got professional competence and due care. Professional competence and due care. Because this is in respect, so there's a lack of knowledge... Um, which I think it's described as um, digital, I think he's limited knowledge of the new business model. So, well, the new technology. That's Mr. Fricklin. I won't write it, but it's interesting in the answer. They've also picked up on the fact that it seems to imply that he may not be ethically aware of things like ethically sourced materials and therefore says well that sh too for a modern accountant shows a lack of professional competence and certainly integrity well particularly because the fact that again he was dishonest about his knowledge Mr. Fricklin, if he has deliberately erased the data, well, again, that could be integrity, or you could link it, if you wanted to, to professional behaviour. So this may be whether he deliberately erased the data. Now, how do we actually expand on this a bit? Well, I think just try and explain the principles a bit more. So again, professional competence implies that you've got up-to-date knowledge. You could mention that. Integrity implies straightforward business conduct or straightforward and honest in business 
professional behavior again you might mention things like you're concerned about the reputation of the profession the two bonus marks are given if you link the principle to the scenario and in fact most of the other marks are given for that reason as well so at some stage in the past you've done an audit exam when you did your audit exam it's exactly the same technique in that you need to marry together a piece of knowledge with a piece of scenario the question also asked so this was for eight plus two marks again that's quite generous i think isn't it um he did ask for actions now we've got the two protagonists here mr fricklin and miss pleasant mr fricklin needs to get some training so cpd continuing professional development miss pleasant needs to think about whistleblowing i guess it's mainly about her isn't it so she needs to think about who to discuss this with use internal remedies first so i guess she would discuss the problems well initially with either hr or non-executive directors remember that word audit committee if the company is large enough to have one but there we are ethics always examined some people throw away the marks because they don't apply the principle to the scenario if you do that you should be fine on that part of the question there we go that's question two the one which has accounting standards and ethics. Lovely question.